I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Liam Neeson movie, but the saying goes that if you've seen one Liam Neeson movie, you've seen them all, just in a different location. So it'd be like one is on a plane, like nonstop, and then one is on a train, like commuter and a few others, and then one is in the snow and the ice, like cold pursuit, ice road, the gray, and then another's in the desert, and so they're all the same, and yet they just change locations. Now, that's probably not true at all because the man has done like a million movies, not actually a million, I think 130 plus, and one of those movies is Pastor Roberts, one of his all-time favorite movies, The Kingdom of Heaven. If you've ever heard him teach at like an encounter weekend or something like that, he's, he's referred to The Kingdom of Heaven for decades now as one of his favorite movies, and, and Liam Neeson was in that, but I think this joke probably started around the first Taken movie in 2008, and then there was Taken 2, and then there was taken three and things just kept getting taken that belonged to Liam and and here's the thing about Liam Neeson and his movies and the fact that they're the same except in different places Liam Neeson never pays a ransom never he doesn't negotiate with anybody that is dealing with him he never pays a ransom he just calls the bad guys and then he whispers to them like like this this is my best I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for a ransom, I can tell you I have no money. But what I do have is a certain set of skills. (laughs) Skills that make looking for people like you a nightmare for people like you. And if you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will not look for you, I will find you, and I will kill you. That, that, that's just it's every movie, right? So Now, you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? For, for the rest of the movie, he methodically goes about and kills every bad guy that is there until the movie is over with just him and his, in this case, daughter or family member living. That's it. You say, well, why do I say this? Because I'm a preacher by day and a Rotten Tomatoes contributor by night. No, that's not it at all. I say this because to a certain degree, bear with me, to a certain degree, this is exactly what the people of God were looking for in the Messiah. In essence, they were waiting for Liam Neeson to show up and take out all the Romans and put them back into power. And who could blame them? Because all the past, this is exactly how God had dealt with his people. Do you remember the the Red Sea thing, right? He took the enemies of God and he took care of them and then he put God's people back where they were supposed to be. He redeemed them, if you will. So I have two main verses to look at today, and the first is in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16 through 21. So if you have a Bible with you today, I want you to go ahead and turn to the book of Isaiah. The other text that we're going to use is in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians. So I have a few other scriptures, but these are my two main texts. This is where I'm going to start today so that you can follow along if you're at home or somewhere on your mobile device. It'll be up on the screen as it will be here as well. Here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Now I want you to comprehend with me the craziness of what Isaiah is telling them, what he's saying to God's people right here. It's stunning what he's saying. 
He's saying, remember the greatest event of God's power in deliverance history, the Red Sea miracle. Do you all remember the Red Sea miracle? And they're like, yes, we remember the Red Sea. Man, that gives me chills still today when I think about the Red Sea and how God delivered his people. Man, I love that. Well, forget about that. Wait, wait, wait. You just asked us if we remembered it. This is the greatest story. No, forget about that because God is doing a new thing. Don't forget that God's faithful. Just forget about how he did that. So context for today. We're in week three of our series, Alpha and Omega, the story of Scripture, where we're looking at the four main themes of the biblical story. Creation, which we looked at in week one. Fall redemption and restoration we're also looking at how our own lives follow this same pattern even still today where we find ourselves in God's story even now listen it's not my story I'm a part of God's story and that is so much better than my story that he allows us the privilege of being written in to his story and what he's doing in the earth today So this morning we're looking at redemption, creation week one we covered, the fall we covered last week. You can always go back and listen to those podcasts or watch those online, but today we're talking about redemption. Who doesn't love redemption? Who doesn't love a redemptive story, a redemptive movie? Who doesn't love the opportunity to do what? Give me a chance to redeem myself. Some of you say that when you go to school. There, there, There it is. All right, I'm pulling on it. It won't happen again. I'll just go to this side. We're going to send this off to the, whatever we talked about earlier, that place that we send things off to, the special repair ferry in the sky or something that does that. So redemption, and we love this story. We love the idea of redemption, and yet we often forget that the greatest redemptive story of all time is the story in the Word of God, in the Bible. So let's get back to our passage in Isaiah. This is what the people of Israel were looking for. They were looking for redemption. They were in essence in captivity. They were, they were not in, in power. They were not living as God's people that they hoped and believed and had been prophesied that they would. They knew they served a God who had redeemed them in the past and they needed for him to do it again. Anybody in here knows that you serve a God that has redeemed you in the past and you need him to do it again. How about all the time it feels like? We live as those that are redeemed but are also still being redeemed. There's things that I need God to redeem in my life. There's things that you need God to redeem in your life. There's things that we need God to redeem in the church. There's things that we need God to redeem in the earth still. And that's what he's about. They knew they served a God who had redeemed in the past and they needed him to do it again. And God has always and still is been about redeeming his people. And in this passage, God is saying this. That's why I said it's mind boggling. Forget how I have redeemed you in the past because there's an even greater deliverance that is coming. And if you're looking for me to do it the same way that I did it at the Red Sea, you're going to miss the Messiah. And without the Messiah, there is no true redemption. What you've experienced in the past is a physical deliverance, but what you're going to experience in the future is a spiritual deliverance. How many of you know today that we still prefer physical deliverance over spiritual deliverance? I still like to have a physical deliverance. Why? Because it's tangible. I can see it. It's very obvious. Whereas sometimes a spiritual deliverance is a little bit cloudier to me. I'm not quite sure if it's actually happening. It's not happening the way I asked for it to happen. It's not happening the way I hoped that it would happen. So I'm not even sure if it actually is. And many times God's doing a spiritual deliverance and we're just satisfied and would prefer for him just to do a physical deliverance. Here's the other thing that's going on here and I think it's going on for us as well. The means of our deliverance in situations and circumstances are often missed because we're only looking for God to do it one way. We think there's just one way out. And if we can't get it that one way, then God obviously isn't going to come through. Listen to me. Did you know that when the Israelites were standing between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, there had never been a deliverance of a Red Sea parting before? Nobody was sitting there expecting, well, you know what? As a matter of fact, this sea could actually just open up and we could kind of walk right through. 
There was nobody thinking that. It had never happened before. And yet, there it was. God delivered his people. And if you believe that God can only do something one way because that's what you've seen in the past or that's what you've been accustomed to in the past, then here's what can happen. You can miss what God is doing in the present. We can put an infinite God in a very finite box of our mind and our hearts and our expectations, and this is important. He is always going to go beyond your expectations. So God's ways may change, but his purpose remains the same. How God does things may change. What God does, bring glory to his name and bring his name even greater goodness in your life, is never going to change. That's why the scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But don't miss God in the present because you are stuck in the ways of the past. Don't miss what God is doing in the church. Don't miss what God is doing in the earth. Don't miss what God is doing in our nation. Don't miss what God is doing in your life and in your family right now because you're expecting him to do it the way he used to do it or did it once before. He may be doing something new. How God accomplishes something for this church or how God accomplishes something for your life may be a little bit different than another church or another life. He may have done it one way in the past, but he may be doing something new right now in the present. But if it's God, it will always bring honor and glory to his name, and it will always bring goodness to your life because that's all God is able to do. That's who he is. Here's something else. Whatever God is doing, even if it's new or old or different than before, it will never conflict with his character. It will never contradict his word, but it certainly probably will conflict with what you desire and what you expected. That's just how it is. That's what we just sang about. It's in the fire often. It's in the difficulty that we see God move the most. But here's the truth of the matter. This is what was going on in this story and what Isaiah is saying. This was the problem with Jesus. The people were looking for a Red Sea engulfing the enemy army. The people were looking for Liam Neeson to show up to kick butt and take names. They were looking for this person that's this take them all out and make us in charge again person. But instead, they got a suffering servant and a sacrificial lamb. Instead, Scripture says in Isaiah that they got someone who went to the shearer as a silent sheep, not uttering a word. If Jesus had come, listen to me, if Jesus had come the way that they wanted him to, none of them would have survived. They needed a redeemer. They needed redemption. We still need a redeemer. We still need redemption. Maybe you've heard the phrase, the long road of redemption. If you haven't, maybe I made it up, but I think it's a phrase. I don't know what the etymological roots of that phrase are. It doesn't really matter, but I can tell you this. The road to redemption for Jesus, for us, the road for Jesus was long, and it was excruciatingly difficult and painful. And though not in the same exact manner, all of us, if we're going to follow Jesus, must go down a similar road ourselves where we take up our crosses daily. That's what he said you're going to do if you follow me. Where you take up your cross daily and you die to yourselves as he begins to redeem and to restore what the enemy meant for harm and what the enemy meant to destroy you. And we can be just like the Israelites when the road of following Jesus is not how we expected. It's harder than we thought we signed up for. It's harder than we expected to be delivered and redeemed. We look for another Red Sea. We look for a mighty warrior. We look for a Liam Neeson. And oftentimes God shows up in our lives and it's almost as if he's unnoticed. That's not how I didn't expect a silent, suffering servant. I didn't expect someone that was born in a stable. I didn't expect someone that was poor. I didn't expect someone that had no place to lay their head. I didn't expect someone that hung out with the lowest of the low in society. I didn't expect this to be the redeemer of all nations. So let's look at 
how to understand redemption a little bit better. And in order to do that, we go back to the Old Testament because it's in the Old Testament that we have this fuller understanding of the concept of redemption. So we look at the Bible, we look at the Old Testament, it helps us to understand better what Jesus was going to do in Scripture, what He has done already in history, and He continues to do when we are redeemed. Here's what Colossians 1.13 says. This is such good news. If you know Jesus as your Savior, He's drawing you, maybe you've never given your life to Him, here's what He does. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. That's good news. And He's transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's even better news. In whom we have redemption, and here's the great news, the forgiveness of sins. Woo! That's good. And there's three different words used in Hebrew which convey the idea of redemption, depending on the particular situation at hand, depending on what's needed to be redeemed. And the meaning of these redemptive terms in the Hebrew that we find in the Old Testament deal with legal, social, and religious customs of that time frame, which were somewhat uh, uh, It's foreign to us. We don't really know, understand them. It's maybe even irrelevant, but they're still helpful for us to know. That's why we go into God's Word and we dig into this. And so I'm just going to read them. I'm not not a Hebrew scholar. We actually have some people that are taking Hebrew here right now, and and good for them. They can correct me later, not right now. And and if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, I'm just going to do my best to pronounce them. And and the reality is, is, is these words mean redemption. So the first word is pada, meaning when an animal substitutes or redeems a person or another animal. So you'd sacrifice one animal to redeem another animal or another person. And so we get the root, if you will, for ransom or a price paid from that one. The second word is this Old Testament word, gael, which was used primarily in relation to family rules or obligations. So these are laws governing family property rights. Let's say you and your family have had something that's been in your family for generations. This has belonged in the Gerard family for generations. And then all of a sudden, my family can't keep it anymore. We lose it. We, we, we are unable to hold on to that. Well, then there's somebody that's a relative of mine that can come and redeem that so that property can be put back into our family so that it can continue to be our family's inheritance. That's where we get the idea of a kinsman, kinfolk, if that helps you, kinsman redeemer. So he's going to redeem something for us. It also could be used for not just property, but family. The right of redemption extended to persons in special circumstances. This is the obligation of a man to marry his brother's widow. This is kind of well known. Now let's just go ahead and pause right now. Because this is going to bring up some awkward thoughts in your mind. What if I had to marry my brother's widow? Okay, now you can stop, all right, because you're looking at maybe a family friend or a brother-in-law or something, like, I would never marry them. That's why I picked him or her, right? So, okay, maybe you don't have those thoughts. I mean, I'm just, as I'm thinking about, man, what would I do if I had to marry my brother's sister, my brother's wife? Okay, y'all are very quiet. Maybe y'all think about this often. I don't know. Y'all are weird. Okay, so, well, in the book of Ruth, the right of redemption is extended to this distant relative. And in this story, that's Boaz. That's the distant relative. He is not only redeeming the property, but he's also redeeming Ruth, and she becomes his wife. So Boaz is known as the kinsman, the kinfolk, kinsman redeemer. Then there's a third term in Hebrew known as the kapar, which means to cover. This is where we get the term for to cover sin, to atone, to expiate, or compensate. This is also where we get the idea of paying a ransom. Now, all of these in now into the New Testament, if we move, has this other word, and they're all three terms on occasion in the Greek language. They all are translated by the same verb that means to loose. It means to pay a price, to loose, to free, to consequently pay a ransom. So this indicates while the Hebrew use different words for different situations, they all have the same essential meaning, and it means to redeem. To redeem is involved in all of those circumstances, and this is actually the grace of God, the kindness of God, that in this situation, he's foreshadowing what he's going to do so that in everything that they do, in every situation where they're redeeming some of their property or their family or whatever, it's actually foreshadowing what Jesus is going to do for them spiritually. The concept of redeeming or freeing is a primary concern to us, and it should be because it's always been God's primary concern. 
So listen to this. Here's how it's fulfilled a little bit. Jesus is known as, remember that first word about an animal, sacrifice for an animal? Jesus is known as what? The Lamb of God who was sacrificed, the firstborn and only Son of God, becomes our spotless Lamb, substituting for us on the cross, taking our place and redeeming us. Jesus is also just like Boaz, our kinsman, how he is, the scripture says, our brother, and he is our brother purchasing what? The bride, the church for himself. So he legally, socially, relationally, religiously fulfilled every role necessary to cover sin, to atone for sin, to sacrifice, pay for, and ransom us from sin so that we could be the redeemed that's powerful and that's the word of God so I want that to hang in the air for a moment and you think about how all of this foreshadows and even prepares the hearts and the minds of God's people to see the fulfillment of the redeemer coming in the person of Jesus Christ God wants to reveal himself to us God wants to reveal himself to his people he's so loving and he's so kind that their whole sacrificial system was pointing towards a greater fulfillment of that in Jesus a necessary sacrifice for sin and yet they didn't recognize him Remember, Israel is looking for a warrior king who will forcefully take the throne. And although Jesus, watch this, is in fact called a mighty warrior, he forcefully took the kingdom of darkness and he set himself as king over all. This is the reality. He overthrew an evil army, but because his ways were higher, his kingdom was so much bigger, and his people were so much more diverse and inclusive than what they were looking for, they did not recognize God in the flesh. They thought he was just coming to get the Jews. They thought it was just this one little area. They thought it was just for them. And if you think about it, in every single way, God accomplished more in Jesus. It's the same today. God accomplishes more in Jesus in your life than you can even imagine or think. That's why if you're looking for this, it's actually far better than what you're looking for. I don't want to miss what Jesus is doing in my life because it's so much bigger and better than I expected. Because when Jesus shows up, the scripture says, he he goes far beyond what we could even imagine or think. Just like the people standing there. Well, now, I never thought that that Red Sea would just stand up on its end and we could walk through. Well, I never thought that, well, I never thought Now, that's where his ways are higher than ours. Let's recap the other ways God pointed the Red Sea. Like I said, that was a foreshadowing. It's God's mercy and grace. He's saying, yes, this has been the greatest act of redemption in human history to this point, but there's coming a greater one. But it's going to point to this one by what? Showing us that the Israelites were freed from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, which was the archetypical act of divine redemption. He redeems the Israelites from suffering. He saves them from slavery in order to make him his people and to bring them into the promised land. Does this sound familiar for what Jesus does for those of us who he calls out of slavery to sin and brings us into the promised land of living with him now and forever, abundant and eternal? It was foreshadowing what Jesus did. Then there's that little seemingly insignificant story that I just mentioned about Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, and it's all in the book of Ruth. And scripture says very simply that the child of Ruth and Boaz, who he was redeeming, so they could carry on the family name. That child's name was Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. And Jesus was known as the son of David. And suddenly you realize that all along something far greater, far bigger than they could have ever imagined had been going on behind the scenes as they were being obedient to do what God had told them to do. God was not only plotting for the temporal blessing of a few Jews in Bethlehem, he was preparing for the coming of the greatest king that Israel had ever known, King David. And at that name, David carried this hope of the Messiah. That's the line that the Messiah was going to come out of. And peace and righteousness and freedom and 
freedom from pain and guilt and all of those things. And that simple little story of Ruth and Boaz foreshadowing what God would do for us through Jesus, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, our kinsman, redeemer. There's so much more in that story, but I'll say this. In the book of Ruth, what we see is that God's purpose for your life, our lives, is greater than you can imagine. So you're just saying, Pastor Brent, that I just, I'll be obedient to God and just do all these seemingly insignificant things that I don't even see what God's doing, and he's doing something far greater behind the scenes that I don't see at times? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what God's word is saying, that God's purpose for your life, the life of his people, is to connect us to something far greater than ourselves. God wants us to know that when we follow him, that when we obey him, that we love him with our lives, that means there's so much more going on that we could ever imagine. And for the Christian, there's always the connection between the ordinary events of our life and the remarkable work of God throughout all of human history. Everything we do in obedience to God, no matter how small no matter insignificant, is actually connected to something bigger than we thought possible. To our point today, because God is a redeemer, our lives can have meaning and purpose right now and forever. Why? Because God is a redeemer. He's redeeming right now. 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Mark 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? A ransom for many. I'm so glad that God came and paid the ransom, that he didn't come like Liam Neeson. So let's unpack just a little bit more this idea of redemption. Because we see the word ransom again. Redemption means deliverance from slavery or captivity by paying a price or a ransom. But let's just set some theological boundaries right here about this. Because don't answer out loud, but I'm just going to ask this question. Don't answer out loud, but who did Jesus pay a ransom to? Because there's some erroneous thought for some that God had to pay a ransom to the devil. And nothing could be further from the theological truth. God owes no one anything, never has, never will, especially Satan. And I love how one pastor describes this train of thought. No way is the death of Christ a negotiation with Satan or a payment to Satan. When Christ meets the demonic forces in his ministry, they don't say, did you bring the money? He commands and they go. No negotiations with the kingdom of darkness. Listen to what Paul says when he describes what happened to Satan on the cross through Jesus paying the ransom. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, in Jesus. This is total defeat. This is not a negotiation. I've not seen anywhere other than maybe, I don't know, the Chronicles of Narnia movie that God pays the devil a ransom. A ransom was paid. But the ransom was paid by God to God for our release from bondage and captivity. Our ransom was paid by God in Christ to God in sending his son to die. He died to rescue me and you from sin and death because we could never ever repay the massive debt of glory that we owe to the Father. And the payment was not monetary currency. The Bible says the payment was the blood of Jesus that restored the glory of God. This is what Paul says in our other text for this morning. And I'll begin to draw this to a close. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Let's unpack this just a little bit. Jesus, the Son, purchased our salvation, Paul says. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This means that there's an emancipation. That's what redemption is. It's either an emancipation of slavery or prisoners that were once bound up. 
And that's what we all were. We were once slaves to sin. We were once prisoners to the enemy. And Jesus redeemed us. He emancipated us and brought us into his kingdom of light out of the kingdom of darkness. So the ransom price is specified as being through the blood of Jesus. The price paid for our redemption from bondage to sin was immeasurably costly, excruciatingly difficult. It was the road to redemption. It was the blood of Jesus himself poured out in his death on the cross. What was foreshadowed in the Levitical system of sacrifices was realized at the cross. Where the Son of God laid down his life as a sacrificial lamb, ransoming us from sin. Then verse 7 says we've been, we receive forgiveness. That means loosing a person from what binds him or her. Did you know that that's why forgiveness is so important? That it looses you from what you've been bound to. And that this again is pointing to something that was happening in that Levitical sacrificial system. Here's what happens. It actually means it's a verb to send away. What does God do? He sends your sins away. The scripture says as how far? As far as the east is from the west. That's how far the Father has taken our sins from us. That's how far he sent them away. That means they'll never meet again. This is what happened to the scapegoat in the Levitical system. They'd put the sins on the scapegoat and they'd send them into the wilderness to make that sacrifice. Jesus became our scapegoat. And the riches of God's grace are so lavish that he's forgiving both our sinful condition and our sinful acts. Also, God is not just forgiving you for what you have done wrong, but he's also setting you free from the power that sin used to have over you. He's freeing you from the spiritual forces that once bound us and kept us into captivity. Man, that's such good news. I'm not just freed from and forgiven for what I've done. I'm also freed from from the forgiveness of sins, from what the enemy used to do by controlling my life through those sinful patterns and those things that I used to be in captivity to, but now I've been set free from. Then Paul keeps on telling us how blessed we are in verse 8 with every kind of wisdom. Here's what that means. It's knowledge which sees things as they really are. Can I just tell you? how much I pray for this type of wisdom, how much this type of wisdom will be so powerful in the church right now if we could see things for how they really are. And then he says, not just wisdom, but then he says also with every kind of understanding, which means the discernment that leads to right actions. I'm going to discern rightly what I'm supposed to do that's righteous. Verse 10 says, when the times reach their fulfillment, And it does not refer simply to the future because Christ has already come to redeem us and he's already adopted us, Galatians says. And by virtue of his death and resurrection, he's already assumed headship over the church, Romans says. And he's also behind the scenes, Colossians says. He's already ruling over the universe right now. But there is a future emphasis. It's the now and the not yet that we find ourselves often in the body of Christ. Yes, I am redeemed, but I'm still continuing to be redeemed. Yes, I've experienced the redemption and the forgiveness of sins, but there's areas of my life, my friends, just like there's areas of your lives that still need to be redeemed. There's relationships that need to be redeemed. There's circumstances that need to be redeemed. There's all kinds of redemption. And until Jesus returns, we won't know the fullness of that redemption, but we're still those that are redeemed and continuing to be redeemed. This is why this is so important. Why does it matter? Because guess who is part of this future emphasis and showing that we have a redeemer that lives? The church. We, in focus, along with the church universal, we are a massive part of being those that are redeemed because the visible unity of the church that we're supposed to have is a foretaste of Christ's eventual visible rule over all things. This is why Paul stresses this unity between the Jew and the Gentile in the church. This is why he stresses that they practice love among Christian brothers and sisters so that people can know that they've been redeemed. This is why I continue to stress and emphasize diversity within unity today inside the church right here in Evans, Georgia, and that our church specifically love one another and love the foreigner and love the one that's far off whether they're in Haiti or whether they're in Afghanistan that we love because if we have been redeemed then we are to act and to live like we are the redeemed. (laughs) 
And what does that look like? Titus 2 gives us a scripture and says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What do the redeemed look like? People that are eager to do what is good. Or go back to Isaiah, people that are called to show forth his praise. This is the now and not yet tension to redemption. As Christians, we've been redeemed from sin, but there remains the final consummation of our salvation that one day Christ will bring when he returns and all of creation will be redeemed. That's why creation even groans and cries out now and it will be restored. But until then, God is still at work, church, redeeming and restoring. Isn't that good news? I don't know what you've got going on in your life. I don't know what relationships you've got going on in your life. I don't know what circumstances you've got going on. I don't know what the needs and all the things that you're working through and crying out to God for that needs to be redeemed and restored. But he's more than able. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could even ask or think. So don't put him in a box thinking that he's going to do it the way that he's always done it. He might do it in actually a completely new way that's actually far greater and bigger and better. It doesn't mean it'll be easy. Actually, it could be excruciatingly difficult. But it's going to take you to a place of being delivered and looking more like his son than like yourself I'm thankful that our loving creator determined to turn evil and suffering that we have as humans have caused into good that will ultimately be for his glory so his master plan was to send his son to take our place and to redeem us for himself And now we have the story of redemption laid out in Scripture in rich detail. Every page unfolds God's glorious plan from Genesis 3.15 in the fall all the way through Revelation and even today of the rescue and the redemption that culminated in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, His Son. And the road to the cross was for our redemption. And the narrative of our life ends the same way. It ends in death. But that's good news because in Christ, every death leads to a resurrection. In Christ, everything that was once meant for harm or death or whatever the case may be can now be turned into something that is meant to bring glory and honor to God. The good news of the gospel is that in Christ, death always leads to resurrection and a life that honors God and redemption should always lead to honor and glory to God. Here's what Psalm 107 says. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story those he redeemed from the hand of the foe those that he redeemed from slavery to sin those that he redeemed from the curse those that he redeemed from death those that he redeemed tell your story I'm going to tell you right now that if you as a church this service and the previous service if all of us would be about telling our story of how God redeemed us there'd be a lot more redeeming going on around us. There'd be a lot of people that maybe have walked away from God. Maybe they've walked away from the church. Maybe they've never walked with God or never been a part of the body of Christ. Those that are in dysfunctional situations, those that are lost, those that are broken, that if we would just tell our story of how God is the redeemer and that I have been redeemed, that I was once broken, that I was once in prison, that I was once lost, but God redeemed me. If we would just tell our story, that's his story, we'd see a lot of redeeming going on around us. This is the second service, and it always goes a little bit longer than the first, so I'm sorry. But if you want a shorter service, come to the first service. Um, I shared with the volunteer teams this morning something that was going on in my life personally, and thinking about those small and significant things that we do. And, and this, could, this is for all of us in wherever we are, where we're in school, where we're students, where we're single, married, old, young, it doesn't matter. That's why I love this church. 
multi-ethnic, multi-generational, all kinds of different backgrounds. God's got our story spread out all over the place. That's why I'm telling you, God wants to do something redemptive through In Focus Church. The enemy hates it, but God has a purpose, and he's going to fulfill that plan to redeem certain places and people and relationships and this community through this body. We just have to be willing to walk down the long road. So I, I went and got uh, a tattoo recently, and whatever you think about that, I don't really care. But the, um, I, I, so I, I, was, I, I was getting this, and I walked into this tattoo place. I'm not going to say where it is. I'm not even going to say the guy's name. He could actually be watching right now. But um, I walked in, and I said, this is what I want. And they said, well, hey, how, how about you, uh, we'll give you to this guy. This guy's like walking in with like ink and stuff. I'm like, does he work here? And uh, yeah, he just got here today. I'm like, oh, that feels good. Um, so I walk in and, and, and I talk to him and like I, we set the thing up and, and he starts telling me a story and he's like he's from you know Midwest somewhere and, and I won't even say the place and he's moved all the way really across country he knows somebody here he's just staying he's trying to get his life back together he's in the middle of this nasty divorce and, 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 and lots of words and colorful words and blankety blank 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 I'm like man I hear you that's that yeah and I said well you know um, I I because it always comes up, well, what do you do? <laughs> well, I, I'm a pastor down the church. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's, uh, I can't, I won't use all the other words. That's, that's blank and awesome, bro. And, and, and so I begin to just share a little bit about what I do and what, what this the whole tattoo is about. And, oh, man, that's really cool. And then he starts sharing with me about his divorce and how ugly it is and, and, and how bad it is. And so I go back yesterday. This is like two weeks later. I'm going to show him what it looks like. And, I, and I'm like, because I can't get him off my mind. I actually texted him a few times. I invited him to church. He's like, you know, blank, yeah, I'll be there. You know, and so um, good. I don't think he was, and that's fine. But uh, I walk in. It's like, well, he's not here. I'm like, where is he? He doesn't work here anymore. I'm like, okay. He's back in his hometown. He's coming back, but he's dealing with it. I knew because we texted. He was back dealing with his divorce. And, and so I texted him. I was like, hey, man, where are you? Guess he goes, call me, bro. Like, mind you, I don't know this guy. So I'm like, okay, I call him. And he's like, man, and this, he starts telling me. I'm like, so I go through this story, and he's telling me what he's doing. I'm like, listen, I'll tell you what. Tell me how I can pray for you. I'm just over here finalizing this divorce, and it's ugly. I said, tell me how, how I can pray for you. <laughs> he just texts me. I did not, I swear. Now he's just sharing some stuff that's going on, but as I text him a little bit, he texts back, we're talking about tattoos and stuff. He's like, I'm really thinking about the church thing as well, brother, on a real note. And here's what I said. I said, yeah, the church is the place to be for broken people like me let me know what I can pray for you about next thing I hear from him later on he's like thanks I just feel lost brother and my next reply was very simple I'm like that's actually great because we first have to realize that we're lost before we can truly be found it's painful but it's the road to redemption I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you feel lost. But I know when you realize that you are, it's the painful road to redemption where everything can be restored and made new. That's what we are about. That's what this church is about. And even the small, insignificant things that you do in life, maybe even getting a tattoo, however you feel about it. But if you'll be obedient to God and listen to his voice, he might set you up to change and redeem somebody's life, to pull them back into the family that their destiny and their purpose was headed in a complete different direction. That's what God does. He's a redeemer and he's redeeming lives through this church in this community. Amen. God, we thank you that you are a redeemer. We thank you that you redeemed lost and broken people like me. 
We thank you that you answer prayer. We thank you that you take the seemingly insignificant details of our lives and you do something far greater than we could imagine or think behind the scenes until one day eyes are opened up to the greatness of who you are. God, would you continue to do that through our lives? With every head bowed and every eye closed before we sing a song calling on God to do the miraculous. If that's where you are today, you need a miracle. You need God to redeem what is almost, in your mind, unredeemable. Here's what I want you to know. God is in the business of doing the miraculous. And what you think cannot be redeemed is easy for him to redeem. What you think cannot be restored is nothing for our God to actually restore. What you think is lost forever is nothing for our God who searches with his eyes to find whom he can support and find and embrace and redeem and restore. Whatever it is, it could be you, it could be a friend, it could be a family member. Look, there's things that God wants to redeem in this church. There's people that God wants to bring home to this place. There's people that God wants to bring back home to this place. There's some miracles that we need as a church to continue to do what God's called us to do. We're calling out with you. We're calling out for you. Let's do this together as we call on the goodness and the miraculous power of Jesus.